If you've got a Bible there this morning, can you turn with me to Luke chapter 14? Luke chapter 14. I read a, a story this week. It was a, a cool story. Who, who's a golfer here? Anyone, anyone play golf? Oh, Kids Church are going out. Kids Church are going out now. Yeah, give the kids a hand on their way out. Give them a clap. <laughs> awesome. One thing you've already noticed this morning, we're like clockwork on top of everything. If you want a clockwork church, get one where humans aren't involved. If there are humans involved, there'll always be imperfections. Read a story this week. So who are golfers here? Who plays golf? I know a few people around here love it. Hey, don't be embarrassed. It's a sport. So, some hands up, hands up if you call golf a sport. Okay. So I've got some golfers here. Anyway, I read this amazing story about Jack Nicholas. Everyone know who Jack Nicholas is? He was an amazing, amazing golfer. And I read this story this week that in 1972, apparently Jack Nicholas had like his worst year of, of professional golf ever. He had an absolutely shocking year in 1972. <laughs> so what he did at the end of that year, um, he decided that he would, he, he would go back to his first ever golf coach. So the coach that he had when he first started playing golf. He contacted him by phone and said, can I come back to you and I want you to teach me how to play again? I mean, he's a guy that's won all kinds of majors and, and lots and lots of money. He had a bad year and he rang up his first coach and he said, would you uh, teach me, can I come and would you give me some lessons and teach me how to play again? So he went back to his first ever golf coach and his golf coach taught him how to hold the, the club again, taught him how to get his grip right. His, his coach taught him how to, to stand when he, when he was going to hit the golf ball. I mean, we're talking a guy that has won major titles and, and has been the best golfer in the world. And, and here's this guy teaching him how to hold a club again and how to hold his feet. He taught him how to swing, how to pivot his hips and, you know, do the, the golfer leg thing where the leg goes up at the back. Anyone play golf? Anyone do that? When you hit your thing, they do it on TV. Like that. I can't. My feet stay on the ground. That's probably why when I hit it, it goes all every which way but loose. But um, he went back to his original coach and he said, can you teach me how to hit a ball again and how to hold a club and stand and so on. And when I heard that story this week, I thought, you know what, that's, that's kind of what, for me, that's kind of what I think has happened with the church at the moment with COVID. We've had a real chance to go back to the basics again and relearn how to hold a club to relearn how to plant our feet when we have a swing, to relearn how to actually swing that club and, and, and hit a ball straight. In a sense, we have had the opportunity to go back to our first coach. How many of you know that it's all about what Jesus did on a cross 2,000 years ago? It's not about being entertained. It's not about the lights and the bells and the whistles and the perfection and the grandiose stuff that, you know, somewhere along the way, maybe, maybe, just maybe some people lost sight of what it was all about. And instead of walking away on a Sunday going, that was a great morning because I encountered God, people walk away going, that was a crappy morning because the keyboardist hit the wrong keys. Well, that morning was terrible because the preacher just wasn't that polished this morning. He, he was discombobulated in his thought patterns. Just wanted to get that word in there. Or, or the, 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 the air con was too cold so it was a terrible morning or it was too hot. They didn't have the temperature right. The coffee, just they didn't have the right coffee and they ran out of sugar and we can get caught up in all these other things and forget we're gathering around Jesus. We're gathering around the death, the burial and the resurrection of God who came to earth as a man. That's what we're gathering around. That's what it's all about. And, 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 and you know what? I know, and I say this with, with respect Jesus is one of the biggest money-making industries in the world today. Jesus on your, your pins or your brooches, on necklaces, Jesus cups with scripture verses on them, Jesus shirts, Jesus everything. And I, and I don't say that, I, I really don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but I do know this, you know, you can go online and, 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 and we've got this great message series and you pay us, 50 bucks and we'll send you the 10 part DVD series. And, and again, look, I will work as worthy of his wages. I'm not having a go at it. But I'm just saying that, that, that somewhere along the line, I wonder whether Christianity has become something and been portrayed to the world as something other than what it is. It's, it's, it's a moment in history where God came to earth as a man and took upon himself the punishment that you and I deserve so that we didn't have to go through that. 
Uh, one of the, the verses that Debbie read out this morning, he who knew no sin, he became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. In other words, he became sin. He was not, Jesus never sinned, yet he became sin itself. He was sin on the cross. So that you and I could become the righteousness of God. We are not in ourselves the righteousness of God, but because of what Jesus did, we're righteous. Even though you blew it this morning, even though you had an argument on the way here to, to our gathering this morning with the person in the car with you, even though you're driving along and, and at one point you're in the back doing this to the kids, oh, get your, get your pull over this car. And then you get to the door and we go, let's put the mask on. Hallelujah, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> hey, we're chuckling, but we're chuckling nervously because it's our story. Hands up if it's your story. None of us are perfect. None of us have made it. None of us can stand here and go, I don't need the cloak of Jesus over me anymore because I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good by whose standards? The person next to you? Maybe. But you're not going to be judged by the person next to you. You're going to be judged by the standards of God. And God's standard is ultimate, absolute, total perfection and holiness. Now hands up if you've reached that. We should all be putting our hands down to the ground. It's not a dance either. But I wonder whether this moment in history has given us a chance to just get back. You know, it's just a little thing. But one thing that we decided we were going to do is even as restrictions ease and we come out of this COVID thing, you know, we're not going to put out, remember, can anyone even remember when church used to have neat rows? Can you remember back that far in human history? Remember when we used to have the chairs? Anyone remember that? Remember there used to be nice, neat rows and we used to make sure that there were a certain distance back and, and now it's like a dog's breakfast out there when I'm looking at you. There's chairs here, chairs everywhere. There's a little bit of a curvature happening, but you know what? You walk in here on a Sunday, you feel free, grab a chair, put it wherever you want. We don't care. Because it's, it's just not about that. It's not about how pretty it looks, how good it looks. It's, it's, it's about gathering together around that moment in history and reflecting back and going, that moment in history was so powerful. But what happened there, the power of that moment is still available to us 2,000 years later as much as it was to the very first person that ever bowed their knee to Jesus. That same God, that spirit that walked or floated or drifted or consumed whatever it did into the tomb and touched the lifeless body of Jesus and brought him back to life, that spirit is available here right now in this place. And if you have made that decision to follow Jesus and be a disciple, that spirit resides in you. And you're sitting there going, but I don't feel it. It's not about feelings. It's about faith. And when you, when, you, when you start to believe and start to live as if what God says is true, you start to experience that what God's saying is true. We don't sit back and wait for the feeling. I don't feel like a child of God. Well, according to what these ancient writers who were closer to Jesus and knew more than me think, I am a child of God. So if that's what they think, it doesn't matter whether I feel it, they're telling me I am. So I'm not going to live by the way I feel. I'm going to put some faith in this and I'm going to go, well, that's who I am. And what I found in my own journey is the more I actually believe what God has to say, make that choice to leap across that deep chasm of faith and go, I'm going to believe you. When I make that decision, that's when I start experiencing and feeling. That's when I have those encounters with God that, that confirm and entrench me in the truth of what this has to say. But I feel like we've got that opportunity to, to, to go back. What did Jack Nicholas do? He went back to his first ever golf coach. 19 years of age, my first ever golf coach, Jesus Christ, the one I bowed my knee to, that's the one I feel like I'm going back to. There's some great Bible teachers out there and great online preachers and great churches and movements and so on. But you know what? I'm going back to Jesus. I love what Paul wrote and I love what Timothy, uh, what he writes to Timothy and I love what Peter writes in this book and I love what Joshua wrote and I love the stuff Moses put together and moved by the Spirit, but I love the words of Jesus. I love what Jesus says. I love what He's about. I love what He did. I love His values. I love His ethics. And I'm going back to Jesus. That's what I feel like. We're going back to our first ever golf coach. And then what did He do? He went back and He said to the golf coach, you teach me how to play golf again. Because over the years, you know what happens? You start playing golf, then you start hanging out with really good golfers. And this guy's really good. He, and you start getting tips off all the really good golfers. So then you start putting in some things. And you know what? It might have worked for them and it might have worked for them, but it might not work for you. Might not work for you. 
And you know what? In Christianity today, there are so many great teachers and great preachers and great bits of godly information that gets given to us. And there's nothing wrong with all that. And I encourage you, read good Christian authors and books and sit under good teachers, listen to good preaching. It's great. But go back to the first ever teacher you had and start doing some of the things that he's saying to do. Because you know what? That golf teacher taught him nothing but basics. And on the back of basics, you know what he did? He went on to become the greatest golfer in the world. But somewhere along the line, he lost the basics. And this is almost like it's our chance to get back to the basics of what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus. We've been doing a series for about eight weeks and and we've called it, I wish he didn't say that. Now, the reason we've termed it that is because just about all those, you know, those passages in the Bible that you read over, but you read them real quick. You don't want to stop and think about them because you just wish he never said it. Nobody wants to be told unless you, 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 you know, uh, lay down your life, unless you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You can not possibly be a disciple. Nobody wants to hear that. So we rush over them really quickly and we don't give them a lot of time and thought. They're not the biggest selling books at Kurong. The biggest selling books at Kurong are uh, How to Get Rich. Five Steps to Prosperity, the the Seven Steps to Divine Healing, the stuff you get from God, anything we can get from God, they're the biggest selling books. That's what we love. But when Jesus says about counting a cost, we're like, eh, I'll get to that eventually. But I want the exciting stuff. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And so we've been looking at some of those passages. And I want to move our attention uh, this morning in a little bit of time. We've got Luke chapter 14. I'm going to put my glasses on so I'm not reading another book. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 28. Here's what Jesus says. It says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me, hands up in this room if you're an anyone. Is there any, are there any anyone's here? About 12. Eh, tell you what. 12 anyone's, that's like I'm speaking to you. Okay, the rest of you, you just water off a duck's back. But the anyone's, if there's any anyone's in this room, Jesus is speaking to you. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Hands up if you wish he never said that. I wish he didn't say that one. That's heavy. That's heavy. That's not salt and vinegar chips and mint slice biscuits that's kumquats and squash and nobody likes them why do they even exist if anyone comes to me and does not hate father mother wife children brothers sisters and don't forget the last bit his own life then he cannot be my (coughs) disciple in verse 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? <laughs> it's passages like this that flip the gospel story a little bit, you know? I believe that God loves me to the core. I believe that God sees the best in me, believes the best for me, wants the best for me. I've got no doubt about that. But when that's all I hear... I kind of flip the, the story upside down a little bit and I think, oh, I've become the centre of the universe. Even God, even God thinks I'm the greatest. That's pretty good. Even God puts me at the middle. Even God says I'm the centre. God did this. Must be true. And then Jesus throws in statements like this. See, up to this point, Jesus is doing everything. He's healing, he's providing, he's, to, he's, do, he's giving, giving, giving. And then he comes out with a statement like this. Well, hang on, now it's time for you to give. Now there's a cost involved. Up to this point, you've been following me and I've done everything. Now I'm going to ask you to pay a price, just like I'm going to pay a price. He flips the whole story up and he says this, you're not the center of the narrative, God is, I am. You're not the center of the whole story, I'm the center of the story. I was the one there at the beginning. I'm there at the end and I'm the one that's central in the middle as well. I'm the one. I'm all for God loves me, this I know. I'm all, I know God loves me without a shadow of a doubt, but I also know that I'm not the center of the universe and that God loves me, but there's a reciprocated love back as well. He puts me at the center. You know what I do in, in reciprocation? I put God at the center in response. I make God 
the center of my world. God loves you so much, he gave up everything for you, and our response is to imitate him and to give up this life we have for the sake of him and what he wants to do in the kingdom. Now, here's the thing. People say this statement, following God will cost you everything. Has anyone ever heard that? Following God, it'll cost you everything. Anyone ever heard that statement? What does that even mean? Seriously, have you thought about it? I don't see anybody naked in this room. Either you're not following God properly or he let you keep your clothing. Anyone drive here in a car? Okay, so either you're not following God, Deb and Chris, and either you're not following God or God let you keep your car. Who, who's got a house here? Who lives here under a roof? Anyone in this room? Hey, so either you're not following God or God let you have a house. Either you own it or you're renting, you've got a roof. So, so what do we mean? We say these statements that, that just sound so, God will cost you everything. We go, oh, that's such a deep statement. But what does it mean on Monday? What does it actually mean? I don't see people here. Either you're not following God or it hasn't cost you everything. Let me, let me, let me tell you what your personal following of Jesus is going to cost you. It's going to cost you whatever you are asked to pay. Whatever God asks you to pay, that's what it will cost you. And whatever God asks you to pay, that's what it costs you. I can go today and say, I'm going to buy a kilo of T-bone steaks. And I can go to Aldi's, which I wouldn't recommend. Aldi's meat's not great. That's just my opinion. And I too have the Spirit of God. But I could go to Aldi's and I could buy a kilo of T-bones. And I might pay, what do I pay for T-bone? We don't don't even buy it from there. (laughs) But if we did, we might pay $12 a kilo. Would that be a bargain, Rob? Okay, maybe 20 Two, 22, $22 a kilo at Aldi's. But you know what? Then I go, you know, $22 a kilo. I don't know. I'm going to see if I can get a better bargain. So I go across the road to Woolworths and I go up there into Woolworths and I find a kilo of T-bones and, and I go, ha ha, Aldi's 22. They're doing it for $19.95. Yes, cheaper price. And then I go across the road to Coles and all of a sudden Coles are selling it for $37. So I don't shop there. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing, we're all paying a price, but it's a different price depending on which store you go to. And the price that I have had to pay to follow Jesus in my life, to be a disciple, the price I've had to pay is gonna be different to the price you have to pay. It'll be different to the price you have to pay and the price you have to pay. We make these blanket statements, it'll cost you everything. No, it won't. It'll only cost you whatever Jesus says is gonna cost you. It's only going to cost you whatever He says because of what I have for you to do, where I want you to go, how I want you to live. Here's what it'll cost you. But it's going to be different for you and different for you. Like the rich young ruler we spoke about eight weeks ago. Why did Jesus tell him to sell everything and give it to the poor? Because he asked Jesus, what do I do? It was a question. All Jesus did was answer a man's question. He didn't say it to everybody. He just said it to this one man because he asked him a question. Oh, it's going to cost you everything, brother. Well, no, it's not. It's going to cost you whatever he asks you to pay. That's what it's going to cost you to follow Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. And at the end of the day, it's up to you whether you want to pay it. But he's going to ask you according to whatever it is that he has for you and for your life. Now, here's the thing. The the passage we just read, it talks about, you know, if you're going to build a tower, right, you sit down and you count the cost first, correct? Correct. So, so quite often when we hear counting cost, it's a negative. So much of what Jesus said that we misunderstand, we assume it all to be negative. Counting a cost or the cost. No, no, no. The, the, the cost is not a bad thing. The way that Jesus described counting a cost, if you're going to build a tower, Mick, we built this stage together, right? You, me and Bevan. Will you and Bevan help me? And um, we, we, by the way, we've got the best stairs of any church in the world. How cool are these stairs? I can do this. If I want to, I can do that. Run up and down. I can even curve around if I want to. Awesome stairs. Awesome stairs. I digress. Um, what was I just talking about, Jack? <laughs> I just lost my train of thought there. Um, so anyway, I was saying something really good. And if you were spiritual, you'd be listening to the Spirit, not me, and you would know exactly where I was going with my last point. Let me go back and see if I can find myself. Exactly the cost. He says this, we're building a tower. And he says, so you sit down first to count the cost to build the tower. 
So counting the cost is not some heavy, bad burden thing. It becomes a good thing. It's a great thing because you sit down and you count the cost so that you have success and victory. So counting the cost is not some dreary bad thing. The end result of counting the cost is so you can actually have success and do really well. And so Jesus is saying, you know, you count the cost of what it means to follow God in your own world, but don't count the cost as if, oh, the cost. Some people carry on, oh, the cost is so heavy. Oh, my burden, it's so hard. Yet the end result of any, any time God wants you to pay a price for something. What you're getting in exchange is so much better than what you're giving up. It's got so much more value than what you're paying. That's the way it works in God. He's not a God that wants to rip you off, rob you of joy, take away from your life, put a burden on you so the rest of your life you look like the hunchback of Notre Dame with all these things you're carrying. It's not God. Anytime God asks you to give something up, He's got something better. He's got something better. We pay a price to get something better. Now, I've got to humble myself before you today. I've got to humble myself because I've preached on this passage before and I'm going to tell you how I've approached it before. And it's only the last couple of days reading it where I feel like my eyes have sort of gone ping a little bit and I've thought, oh, I don't know that I've handled this passage really well in the past. So here's what I want to say to you. I've always said, hate your father, your mother and so on. And here's what it means. It means that your love for God must be so great that your love for your family looks like hatred. Now, now I want you to hear this. Park this thought. There's, there, there's, there's, the concept of that phraseology is true. But I don't know that I've described it really well when I put it that way. Let me, let me ask you this question. Love God so much that your love for your family appears as hatred. Appears to who? Who's it appearing to? Are we supposed to love God so much that our love for our family, according to God, looks like God sits up there and goes, oh yeah, you look like you love me so much more than your family, so much that it looks like you hate your family. I'm so happy with you. Awesome, that's great. Because I can see your love for me is so wonderful that it looks like you hate your family. Well done, good and faithful servant. Do we really think, is that our heavenly father? Are, 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 we, are we trying to, to love God so much that it appears hatred to our family to, in the eyes of God? Well, that's ridiculous. God knows the heart anyway. You can put on any appearance you want. He sees straight through it. You can wear whatever you mask, whatever mask you want to put on. Don't be mistaken. Don't kid yourself. God looks at your heart regardless. So we can't be doing this to put on appearances for God. What about appearances for yourself? Maybe I've got to be, be living a life where I, my love for God looks like so much that my love for my wife and daughter and kids looks like hatred and, and must appear that way to me. So I keep doing things till I get to a point where it looks like, yeah, no, it looks like I hate them enough. <laughs> Whoa, we've landed somewhere. Awesome, this is great. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Of course not. We, I mean, we chuckle about it because we know how ludicrous. What about to the rest of the church? Maybe that's what it means. Maybe, it's, maybe we need to love God to the point where to the rest of the church, they go, oh my goodness, he just loves God so much. Look at him, he neglects his family. That's awesome. He doesn't even care about what they're going through. He gives all of his money to the church and they can't even buy a meal. What a holy man. Come on. Of course not. So love God to the point where it appears that our love for our family is hatred. To God, no. To self, no. To church. And let's go one step further. What about to the world? What a great witness. Every, every person in here, if we could just learn to hate each other, boy, could we reach the world. Hey? Couldn't we reach, the, I mean, if this is really the true interpretation, couldn't we reach the world for Jesus? All we got to do, we've got it back to front. We thought if we loved each other that we could reach them. How stupid. All we've got to do is love God so much that they look at us and go, it looks like they hate each other. Yes! Come Holy Spirit! Invade our land! Now I'm saying all that tongue in cheek because we all know that that's not true. So I'm trying to wrestle with this statement. What does Jesus mean when he says, if you don't hate father and mother, and brother and sister and all this stuff, then you cannot be my disciple. He doesn't say it's going to be hard to be my disciple. He says you can't be. You can't be. So what exactly does he mean by hate? Let me just, just throw another verse at you really quickly. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. 
Jesus makes this statement. He says, no one can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. Now, now what Jesus is saying there, do you think that's literal? That you can't actually like two things? You, you, you're either going to love one thing and hate everything else. How many, who, how many of you have got more than one kid? Love one, you've got to hate the other. Or do you... <laughs> Or do you have room in your heart to actually love both those kids? So it's not a literal thing. Jesus isn't saying here, you can't serve two masters and the reason you can't serve them is because you will love one and hate the other. He's not saying literally, if you've got two masters, everyone in this room is gonna love one and he's gonna absolutely hate the other. He's not saying literally. He's just saying that one of those masters is going to have preference. One of those masters is going to take a place of preference in your life. You can't serve both completely the same because one is always going to have preference in your life. Go back to the Old Testament. There's a passage in Genesis 29, verse 30 to 31. Speaking of Jacob, now we all know the story that, uh, that, that Jacob works hard to get the love of this girl called uh, uh, Rachel, and then he gets duped and ends up getting given a different daughter called Leah. And so he works another seven years and finally gets Rachel. So he's got these two wives. And in Genesis 29, 30, 31 says this, Jacob also went into Rachel and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. They didn't say hated Leah, just says he loved Rachel more than Leah. And they go to the next verse, then Jacob also went into, Ra- uh, went into Rachel, he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still another seven years. Verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, now if you've got a King James Version, it'll have the, the, the actual rendering of that word is literally hated. Now, it doesn't say, Jacob didn't say that he loved Rachel and hated Leah, it says he loved Rachel more. But then it says when God looked down, he saw that he loved Rachel and hated Leah. It's, it's a, a figure of speech. It's not a literal rendering. It's not literally saying that he loved one and hated the other. It's say, basically saying that he preferred Rachel over Leah. Just as if you've got two masters, you'll prefer one master over another. It's about preference. It's not about loving and hating. It's about preference. In fact, Matthew, in Matthew 10, Matthew gives us the same passage that Luke translates, but Matthew gives us a different slant. Matthew 10, verse 37 to 38, it actually says this. It says, he who loved, this is Jesus speaking, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's not talking about you have to literally hate your wife and hate your kids, and hate your family, or you can't love me. It's one or the other, you pick. What he's saying is this, in life, you have to prefer one over the other. Let me make this statement to you. I'm a disciple of Jesus before I'm a husband to Jackie. I'm a disciple of Jesus before I'm a father to Chloe. Now here's the thing. If I'm a disciple of Jesus, then I'm going to love and be a better husband than I would ever be if I wasn't first a disciple of Jesus. So understanding that I'm first a disciple of Jesus makes me a better father to my daughter. Knowing that I am a disciple and follower of Jesus first and that God has brought this beautiful woman into my life and joined us together as one. But knowing that I am first a disciple of Jesus. You see, here's the thing. I was in the mind of God from the time I was born. I will be with Jesus, with God for eternity if my faith is correct. I pass from this world, I'll be with God. If I'm blessed enough, I'm going to have about 60 years with this beautiful woman. He's got me for a lot longer. 
than she does. If I try to go, you're more important to me than God. If I give you preference over God, here's the reality, I'll mess this up. If I put God first, then what God does in my world is He causes me and helps me to do this way better than I could ever have done it on my own. When Jesus says, unless you hate them, you can't be honest, He's not saying, hey, what He's saying is this, you need to understand that you need to prefer me over and above. Now, there are situations in life where people following Christ literally cost them their family relationships. There are people in other nations that follow other religions. You come to faith, you're gone. You're dead to your family. That's the way it works. There are situations that we find ourselves in, even in the West, where people come to faith in Jesus and and they have a partner, a husband, a wife, or children that don't follow Jesus, that are very anti, that will actually cut you off and will hate you. Some people pay that price and that's a reality we can't escape. But it's not God's intention that when He comes into our world that our family relationships dissolve. His highest intention is when He comes into our world, our family relationships are strengthened. But they're only strengthened when I put God first and my wife puts God first. If I put her first and she puts me first, we're on a rocky place. As, as believers, as, as, as being in a relationship with another believer, if I put God first and she puts God first, we're in a better place to be a better husband and to be a better wife. Now, when I came to faith at 19, you know, God spoke to me. And God said this to me. He said, I want you to go and join an organisation called YWAM and I want you to do a DTS, a discipleship training school, six-month training school. And here's what else he said to me in the same sentence. He said, I don't care what your father thinks. Now that sounds harsh, doesn't it? And even at the time, it sounded harsh. I'd only been a believer for a few months. And here's the Holy Spirit speaking to me through a lobster in a Chinese restaurant in Coffs Harbour. I still remember where I was. I'm sitting there at the restaurant about to eat. I'd never heard of of God speaking to you or anything like that. And I'm sitting there and I'm I'm eating something and I looked across. The guys are sitting there, I look past them and there's a fish tank and a lobster and I just hear clear as a bell this voice inside of me. I want you to go to this organisation, YWAM, do a DTS. I don't care what your father thinks. I, I sat there for the rest of the night almost speechless. The other guys are asking me, what's wrong? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I just had no idea of what, it, what was that. I found out later it's God, my heavenly father, saying to me, I'm asking you to do something. Your earthly father is going to ask you not to do it. Who are you going to prefer? Now, here's the end result. I can say this with true sincerity. My relationship with my father is way stronger now because I gave God preference than ever was when I gave preference to him. Love my father, my father loves me, and we have a good relationship. And that's what happens when we put God first. We were just talking, I was talking to my wife this morning, young people. And again, I can get myself in trouble with this message. I understand that. So feel free to shoot me emails later. Young men that we used to pastor in another church, and there was a young man there, had a call of God upon his life to, 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 to be a youth pastor. But he came from a very academic family, very smart, very intelligent people, God fearing family, very academic. And he approached his mum and dad one day and he said, you know what, I feel like God's speaking to me to, to, to not go through to the end of year 12 and to go to Bible college because he's calling me to pastor young people. And they said to him, why would you want to do that? You're so smart. You could make so much more money doing this. And they squashed the idea, poured water on it and talked him out of it. And he gave preference to their voice over what he felt like God was saying. It's a sad story to this day. That guy went on, he made a few mistakes. To this day, last time we spoke to his parents, he's not walking with the Lord. I'd love to take his parents back to that moment and go, you know what? Teach your kids to give preference to God. I'm not saying, children, that you just say, well, God told me I could have that extra cookie, so you back up, mum and dad. I'm not saying that, okay? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this, that my daughter is a disciple of Jesus before she's a daughter to me. Now, I have responsibility over her until you're 18. You'll do exactly what Daddy says until you're 35, 40, maybe. 45, 50. You're never leaving home, Chloe. End of story. And you back up. She's mine. No, no, she's not. She belongs to Jesus. She's a disciple of Jesus. Even at that age, she's a disciple of Jesus. And, and you know what? I parent her best when I remember that. 
I'll parent my kids best when I remember that with my kids. You know the old saying, you know, a lot of pastors use it, you know, Jesus loves you and I have a plan for your life. You know that? Anyone ever heard that? Parents can be like that. Chloe, Jesus loves you and I have a plan for your life. Well, Jesus has a plan too. God has things that he wants to do in and through. I'm a disciple of Jesus before I'm all those other things. Uh, anyone remember Dave Smithhurst? He came here, South African guy. We got him in some time back. Remember Dave Smithhurst came? He spoke Sunday morning here when, when the stage was over there, and then he spoke at a combined church meeting. Yeah, I remember talking to Dave one day, and he shared this story with me. It was really confronting. Me and my wife had just been married not too long, and they came around to our place, and we are having a chat with him, and he shared a story. God opened up all these doors of opportunity for him to go and preach the gospel in, um, I think it might have been Lithuania at the time, one of those nations that was pretty hardened. But he had this amazing open door for ministry and was going in there and, and is still in there planting orphanages and doing amazing things in those nations. Amazing man. He was on his way to the airport with his wife to get on a plane to fly over and they had a car crash. No, sorry, he was driving to the airport. He was with her. They were driving and they had a car crash, major car crash. Somehow he came out okay. She was all banged up and, and everything and had to be taken. The ambulance came, took him off the hospital. And he said, I'm sitting there next to my wife and she's laying in the bed, bruised and bloodied and battered and stuff. A and she turns to me and she goes, what are you doing, Dave? He said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm with my wife. And she said to him, you need to leave. You need to get in the car. You need to go to that airport because Jesus has called you to go and take the gospel to these people in Lithuania. You need to go. Leave me, I'll be okay. My father's watching over me. I can't imagine how hard that would have been. If I'm brutally honest, I don't know what I would have done. But I go back to this passage. If anyone wants to come after me, unless you hate father, mother, brother. In other words, unless you're going to prefer God's will, God's purposes, God's words, God's ideals, over and above all those other people's ideals, you're going to struggle to fully be my disciple. You're going to struggle to realise your full potential in me. It's not about hating. We're not called to hate. Elsewhere in the Bible we know. Paul says you love your wife as Christ loved the church. Um, wives, honour your husbands. Children, respect your parents. Honour your parents. Parents, don't provoke your children to wrath. There's so much love that God has for the family unit. So much love. But at the end of the day, I think God wants us to understand. Jesus wants us to understand. And it's hard for us in a Western context because we don't face a lot of what these original hearers heard. You come to Jesus, it, it will literally cost you. It can cost you your family. It can cost you your relationships. It can cost you your very life. It doesn't cost us so much anymore here in our day and age in the context in which we live. But we've got to live in such a way that kingdom invitations and God speaks and God wants that that takes preference and priority over earthly opportunities and earthly stuff. And that's what Jesus means when he says, unless you hate father and mother, brothers and sisters, husband and wife, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. What he's saying very clearly is unless you give preference to me over and above all of that, then you'll get to the end of the day and you'll make it into heaven, but down here you're going to have fallen short of everything he wanted for you, to give you and to do through you. Amen? The room went very quiet. Father, I want to thank you for your word, God. Your word is life-giving. It's transforming. God, it changes us. It molds us. It shapes us to be the people that you want us to be. And Lord, we, God, we don't want to gather and just be entertained. We don't want to gather and, and, and just have some kind of a meeting like we're in a club. We, 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 God, we, we, we gather around one thing, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, we, we gather because we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We gather because we believe in the truth. God, I don't care if it's 2,000 years later, what, what you said through Jesus is still relevant today. And the power of the Holy Spirit is still available today. And God, you still love people in 2020 in Ganelaba. You still have plans and purposes for our lives. God, you still have plans and purposes for the lives of those that are walking around our streets that don't even know you care for them at the moment. And so, Father, we want to commit our lives to not just being successful down here in this earthly realm, but, God, we want to be a part of that kingdom plan.
God, we want to be a part of the big picture of eternity. We want to play our role where we are right now. And Father, I pray, God, for each of us. We've been spending a lot of time talking about what it means to follow you. We've been, been cutting through some stuff and looking at what it means to be a disciple. And, and uh, God, hopefully, hopefully, um, Father, give a bit more perspective to some of those things that just seem and sound literally impossible. But they're not impossible, God, because you call us to them and you empower us to do it. And there's always something better on the other side of obedience. So, Father, I pray for every person in this room right now, Lord. I just pray as we walk out of this place that, uh, God, we wouldn't just move on to the next thing. Let whatever seeds the Holy Spirit's planted today, let those seeds germinate and let those seeds grow in our hearts, Father. And, Lord, in the next seven days as we go from this place, give every person in this room, I don't care how old, young we are, Give every person in this room an opportunity to tell somebody out there about the goodness of God, somebody that up to this point doesn't know how much you love them. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.